Welcome to this lecture about linear regression. Let's take the following example where we have houses described by their size. So that's the only feature we have. So this is the input. And we also have the prices corresponding to those houses as part of our training data. So this is the output. Now given a new house which has this size, how can we predict its price? We can assume that the relation between the size and the price is linear. This can be true or false, but let's make this assumption. And so training means that we want to find a line that fits the training data in a good way. So the equation of this line looks like this. X here is the size of the house. Theta 1 and theta 0 are parameters that we need to find. Once we find this line, we can use it to make predictions or to predict the price of a new house. So for example, if we have a new house which has this size, we can predict that its price is this one. By varying the values of theta zero and theta one, we get a different line. The training part means that we want to find the values for the parameters theta zero and theta one that gives us the best fit in line. So how can we do that? On the training examples we have, we can try to find the parameter values that makes our predicted output as close as possible to the true output. So we want to find the parameters vector that minimizes some cost function. And the one cost function we talked about previously is this mean squared error cost function. If our predicted values are very different from the true values or the true output, then this cost will be very high. So we want to find the parameter values theta zero and theta one that gives us the minimum possible value for this cost. So we want to find the line so that the sum of those squared differences is as small as possible. To simplify the explanations a little bit, let us assume initially that theta zero is equal to zero. So our line will go through the origin since theta zero is equal to zero. So we just need to find the optimal value for theta one. This is our hypothesis function and this is our cost function. The difference between the predicted and the true output is illustrated here. So for a given house with this size, this is the true output, the true price, and this is the predicted output, the predicted price. And this shows how the mean squared error or cost changes based on different values of theta one. For the optimal parameter theta one, we get this line. It achieves the minimum cost or error. This means that the sum or the mean of the square of those differences is the minimum possible. If we take a smaller value for theta one than the optimal value, then we get this line with a smaller slope. And you can see that the sum of those errors is high, so it achieves a higher cost. Similarly, if we take a much larger value of theta one than the optimal one, then we get this line with a much larger slope and it has a much larger error or cost as we can see here. Let's now introduce theta zero back. So now we have two parameters, theta zero and theta one. So our line does not necessarily go through the origin. This figure shows how our cost function looks like based on different values of theta zero and theta one. We can also illustrate this cost based on a contour plot. So here the same cost values are indicated with the same color. And the closer the color is to dark blue or black, um, the smaller is the cost. Um, so for example, this, this dot here corresponding to this value of theta zero and this value of theta one corresponds to this line. It has a very low cost. This dot here corresponds to this line. It has a higher cost and this dot corresponds to this line and has um, a higher cost. So now that we know what is our cost function, let's see how to optimize it or how to find the parameters that minimizes this cost.
And one way to do that is to use an algorithm called Gradient Descent. Gradient Descent is a general optimization algorithm. It's not only specific to this cost function. We can use it to optimize um, other cost functions as well. So our optimization problem looks like this. We have a cost function, which looks like this. It's the mean squared cost or mean squared errors. Uh, our hypothesis function looks like this. And what we want to do is to find the parameters, theta 0, theta 1, and so on, that gives you the minimum possible value for this cost. So let's now see how gradient descent works. Let's take some example function g that we want to minimize. The function illustrated here is just some arbitrary function that we will use for explanations. It does not correspond to the mean squared errors cost function that we introduced previously. Um, the mean squared error function that we, we saw previously is a convex function. This means that it has only one global minimum, but the function g that we are using here in this example has several uh, minimums. It is a non-convex function. Okay, so what we want to do is to find the values for the parameters theta 0 and theta 1 that gives us the minimum possible value for this function. To do that, we start by picking randomly some values for the parameters theta 0 and theta 1, and then we keep updating theta 0 and theta 1 to reduce the cost until we reach uh, a minimum. Depending on the initial parameter values that we pick, we might end up at a different minimum. This is a local minimum. The mean squared error cost function that we saw previously is a convex function. It looks somewhat like this. It has just one global minimum. So there is a unique solution or unique values for theta 0 and theta 1 that gives us the minimum possible value for the cost. Now the question that you might ask is how does gradient descent work? Or how does it decide at each step if it should increase or decrease each of the parameter values in order to reach um, the minimum of the cost? The gradient descent algorithm looks like this. So we have a loop and at each iteration of this loop we update the parameters. Instead of updating each parameter individually, we can update the parameters vector as a whole. So our parameters vector theta becomes theta minus alpha, this is some learning rate, it's positive number, times the gradient of the cost function. If our alpha is small, then the parameters value will change a little bit at each iteration. And if it is high, then they will change more. We will talk more about this uh, learning rate later in this lecture. And the gradient of the cost function is just a vector containing the derivative of the cost function with respect to each of the parameters. So here it contains the derivative of the cost function with respect to theta 0 and the derivative of the cost function with respect to theta 1. Now let's see the motivation behind updating the parameter values in this way. For the sake of explanation, let's assume for now that we have just one parameter, theta 1, and the values of our cost function with respect to different values of theta 1 looks like this. We start by picking some random value for theta 1, and let's say that it achieves this cost. By taking one iteration or one gradient descent step, theta 1 will be updated this way. Theta 1 becomes theta 1 minus alpha times the derivative of the cost function with respect to theta 1. In this case, the derivative at theta 1 will be positive, as the function at this point is increasing. Since the derivative in this case is positive, and alpha is also positive, then we are subtracting a positive value from theta 1. Therefore, the value of theta 1 will decrease. And that's what we want, because then it will get closer to the optimal value. Now suppose that our initial value for theta 1 was too small, for example here. In this case, the derivative of the cost function with respect to theta 1 will be negative, because the function here is decreasing. So the derivative is negative, and alpha is positive, 
and we have a minus here, and therefore the value for theta1 will increase. And that's what we want, because then theta1 will get closer to the optimal value. The learning rate alpha is called the hyperparameter. If you choose alpha to be very large, then gradient descent will update your parameter too much at each iteration. So when alpha is too large, you may skip or jump over the minimum. So you will fail to converge to the minimum and may completely diverge from it. If alpha is reasonably small, then gradient descent will take smaller steps as we get closer to the minimum until it converges. If you select alpha to be very small, then gradient descent will take very small steps and will need much more iterations before it converges. You can use gradient descent to optimize non-convex functions also. For example, if we take this function, it is non-convex. It has a global minimum here and some local minimums, for example, this one. And if you, you reach this local minimum at this value of theta one, then you get stuck at this value because the derivative at this point will be zero. So by applying gradient descent, the derivative is zero, so theta one will not change. So you get stuck at this point. What you can do is to apply gradient descent several times, each time by starting with a different initial value for theta one. For example, you start somewhere here, and then maybe you will converge to this global uh, minimum. You start somewhere here, and then you will converge to this local minimum, and so on. And then you take the minimum or the theta that led to the minimum of those minimums. Now back to our linear regression example, we said that our hypothesis function is this one. Um, for example, we have one feature, x1, and so we have two parameters, theta zero and theta one. And our cost function is this mean squared errors cost. And this is our gradient descent algorithm as we discussed previously. In this case, the derivative of the cost function with respect to theta zero will be this one. And the derivative of this cost function with respect to theta one will be this one. So this is the gradient. And you can check on this slide how we computed the derivative of this cost function with respect to theta zero and theta one. So please go ahead and pause the video if you want to read uh, in more details how we computed the derivatives. In our previous examples, we have considered just one feature, the size of the houses. But in reality, houses can be characterized by much more features. For example, the number of rooms, the location, maybe the distance to the city center, um, the number of floors, the age of the house, and so on. And here we have the output, which is the prices. So our hypothesis function can be written in this way. So here we have D features. And if we consider one additional feature, x0 equal one, so for any house, we add a one as an additional feature here, then we can write our hypothesis function in a much more compact way, in this way, as the dot product between the parameters vector theta and the feature vector x. So this is our parameters vector. And this is the feature vector corresponding to one house, um, where x here, x0 here, is equal to 1. And to find the optimal parameters vector for our linear regression problem, we also optimize the mean squared error cost function that we saw previously. And we do that using gradient descent again. It's exactly the same procedure. So we have theta becomes theta minus alpha times the gradient of the cost function. And in this case, the gradient is the vector containing the derivative of the cost function with respect to each parameter. And the derivative of the cost function with respect to a given parameter theta j is this one. What we have seen so far is called the batch gradient descent.
It uses all the training examples to update the model parameters. As you can see here, we have a sum over all the training examples. We have also something called online gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. And this one updates the model parameters just based on one training example at a time. So we don't sum over all the examples. We just use one example, xi. And this can be useful in the case where, for example, you don't have all the training data beforehand, but you have training examples which comes one by one over time. For example, you have a stream. Or, for example, when your training data set is very big, um, so it will be computationally expensive to use batch gradient descent and sum over all those n examples if n is very big. Or maybe it doesn't even fit into memory, so you can only uh, process data points one by one. The parameters vector theta changes at each iteration of gradient descent. If you compute the cost at each iteration, then you should see that it is decreasing. When you see that the cost does not change too much between consecutive iterations, for example, the difference is smaller than some value epsilon, some small value, then you can say that we are close to convergence, so you can stop. However, if you see that your cost is increasing, then you are most likely diverging, so you should use a smaller value for alpha. Finally, you should also know that you can do linear regression without using gradient descent. There exist some methods to solve for theta analytically. For example, we know that the derivative of the cost function at the optimal theta is equal to zero. So we can actually set the derivative equal to zero and we solve for theta. By doing so, our final parameters vector theta will look like this. So this, this is called the pseudo inverse. It is x, x is our training um, input data. So x transpose x, the inverse of this, uh, multiplied by x transpose multiplied by y. And y is the vector of outputs. Um, these are the true outputs in our training data. The problem with that is that it is computationally expensive to compute this pseudo-inverse, especially when d is very large, the number of features, um, because this involves um, computing the dot product between each column and all the other columns. So it can take a lot of time if we have a lot of features. And also, this solution here is specific to linear regression with this cost function, the mean squared error. It does not apply to other optimization problems, but gradient descent, for example, can be used to optimize any cost function. If you want more details about how did we find the previous solution, um, by computing the derivative of the cost function and setting it equal to zero and solving for theta, then please feel free to pause this video and check how we did that here.